Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Loving Self Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the God's Gifts to Develop My Loving Self question and answer presentation, Jesus answers questions from the audience about the material covered in the previous presentation, God's Gifts to Develop My Loving Self. Recorded on the 10th of June, 2016, in Newseville, Queensland, Australia. Okay, you're one minute early, guys. Awesome. Might have something to do with the fact that Igor started the song <laughs> early enough. <laughs> Bring you back. Hear that music? You go, oh, there he goes. There he goes. Okay. All right, so uh, we're now doing the Q&A on God's gifts to develop my loving self. So uh, we want to start actually with where we left off, which was we, we, there's some spirits with Mary wanted to ask a question. So okay. far away. Question is, uh, why does it feel like I have to follow man's way of development for a time before having a desire to follow God's way? Hmm. Yeah, anybody can answer that? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> um, Eloisa, thank you. Sorry, I'm just still caught up in the music there. Uh, I don't know if I can answer that, but I'm wondering if it's because we have to discover God's way before we are actually able to recognise that there are two ways. No, this is being asked by a question who knows there's two ways, but still oh. is on man's way. Well, haven't they just made a choice? No, they've got a choice. They have a choice, yeah. So if we go down to Canaan, on this side, thanks. Um, is it maybe because we can't have a relationship with God when we're in our facade and stuff still and that, that's kind of a deconstruction that's on us and not God? In a way? Well, it's sort of a clue, yeah, you're sort of on the right track but if we examine it a bit further, what's a part of our, what's a part of our dominant fears? What are, what are a part of our most dominant fears? If we go to Johnny out the back. Uh, yeah, I don't know exactly what fear, but yeah, because of sin, and we are like born into sin, and well, so that's pro that's yeah, that's true. But we need to be more specific as to what what the problem is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. So if we go back to Mary, because she knows what the problem is. Well, I wasn't getting. Oh, sorry, hang on. Uh. <laughs> Which is there we go. Now yeah. one. Um, I wasn't going to give the answer, rather just give a bit of context. Yes, it would be a good idea so people will be able to work it out. <laughs> yep. So the spirits, uh, they've been here and listening, and now they're aware that they have two choices. Yep. And they've, they've been attempting to develop in the spirit world themselves yep. Yep. to grow in what they call ethics and morality. Yep. But they feel like they still feel like having heard all this information yep. they still feel i still feel i need to follow man's way for a bit longer yep. to develop myself before i feel like i'm going to want to follow god's way yeah it's not true but 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 they do feel that way it's not yes. true that they have to but they do feel that way and what i'm saying is there's is a number of reasons why a person would feel that way and it should be fairly obvious given our the reason why I put it back to the audience is it should be fairly obvious why we might do that. Why are you doing it? Because the majority of you are doing it. So why are you doing it? You think about that. Now we've got a few more hands up. <laughs> we come down to Laura here. So why do you choose to do it? So is it because um, of our pa parents like our beliefs about our parents being projected onto God. That's partly the reason, isn't it? We, we believe that God's going to be react the same way as our parents, and so we have, what are they called? Fears about God, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, so aren't they emotions about God? Yeah. Right, so, so we have emotions about God that we've not yet addressed. And false beliefs as well. Of course, yeah. attached to each emotion is a false belief about God, right? Yep. So that, that's a natural result of the emotion. The, in fact, the false beliefs are actually emotional, aren't they? Mm. So naturally we have some false beliefs about God. And remember, 
we're also having to address emotions, which is a part of humility. And what is a person who develops man way mostly trying to do? Develop intellectually. So can you see just the fact that we're resistive to being overwhelmed emotionally? Where does that fit in there? Global refusal of an emotion, isn't it? It's an emotion. So we're refusing to allow overwhelming emotions. So many of you in that uh, in that place, aren't you? We're we're afraid of overwhelming emotion. Right. Also, you think about it. Many of you are used to doing it man's way. Why? Because that's the way you were taught by man to do things, right? We were taught to learn on earth in an intellectual manner where we're not. And this has been our life. All of our education, isn't it? Like five years of age, most of us went to school here in Australia. And from then on, it's all about developing emotionally, isn't it? Uh, not emotionally, no. <laughs> intellectually, yeah. And so as a result of that, we have a focus on intellectual development. Using our develop using willpower isn't that not true? This is what we're comfortable with. We're comfortable with that, and that is another fear, is it not? That prevents us from doing it God's way because God's way is completely different to that. What other things are attractive about our way at the moment? You think about for yourself what's attractive. If we go, um, if we go to oh, what's that? Katrina, yeah, thanks. We don't have faith in God's way. That's right, we don't. So there's not we've not developed the positive emotion of faith in that in that we don't believe that God's way is going to be better than what we're already doing. Right? So so there's no faith. So that stops us as well. What else? If we come to Raj on this side and um, if we come to Helga on this side? I think we're afraid to swim against the tide of the world's way. Very important. What's our dominant fear? Afraid of being ourselves. We've, fit, we've fitted into the world's way so long, very hard, isn't it, to get out of that concept of, of oh, I'm going to be different to the world if I do it this way different to my friends, different to my family, different to the world, right? Very big thing, isn't it? So it's a, you could say it's a deep fear of being myself or a deep fear, fears related to... Maybe it's a fear of separation. Correct, separation. Uh, AR. And also attack, isn't it, in the end? Mm. We're afraid of being different. We're afraid of very, our very survival depends on it doing man's way. Can you see what we're doing here is we're listing a whole series of emotions that we still have and that causes us to gravitate towards the old way that we've always done things as a gravitating towards what we believe is safer. It's not actually very safe from God's perspective doing it this way. Because you know less it, this way. This way is driven by more fear, false beliefs. Therefore, you know less truth. So obviously that's a big issue, isn't it? But yeah, so the spirits want to say, Mary? <clears throat> so, but won't it get easier <laughs> No. if I follow man's way for a while? No, it doesn't. The longer you follow man's way, the more entrenched you become in man's way and therefore the more resistive to God's way. Makes sense, doesn't it? From a, from a logical perspective, if I follow man's way for a thousand years, right, it's going to be harder for me to transfer that over to God's way, particularly when I know there's two ways, and I would choose to follow man's way for a thousand years, that tells me now that I'm pretty entrenched in doing it that way. The more entrenched I become doing it that way, 
which is only driven, as we can see, by fear and a lack of faith and a number of other emotions. The more entrenched I become in dealing with it that way, the less, I'll pro less possibility or the, the, the more difficult I'm going to find it doing God's way. It feels really terrible. I feel really panicked about doing it another way. And this is the emotion primarily that is causing you to want to do it man's way. It's the global refusal to feel terror that's now kicking in. This global refusal to feel terror now kicks in. And once that kicks in, we have a, a choice. We can choose to feel the terror, which we are capable of doing, or we can revert to our previous behaviour, run away from the terror, which is what we're doing when we choose man's way. Does that make sense? Yep. So what should I do next, really? Well, I would work through, if I'm in that state, I would work through, like I've uh, suggested to the group, they need to work through the reasons why they justify their fear and therefore choose something. So, so the reasons why I don't want to feel fear need to be addressed emotionally. So feel your blocks to feeling fear, your emotional blockages. <coughs> To feeling fear. What are your beliefs about fear? See, for the average spirit who's already developed na with a na in a natural love path, and by the way, for the average person on earth too, who's already developed in a natural love path, they believe they can manage fear. They believe they can cope with fear. They believe they don't have to experience fear. And this is what our primary block is, is it not? And so, so we refuse God's gifts to develop our loving self because fear is dominating and we have all these false beliefs about fear that need to be felt. And if you feel your false beliefs about fear and start feeling about, you know, just releasing them emotionally, in other words, release the emotional justifications for holding on to fear, then eventually you'll get to feel the fear and you'll let yourself do it. The other thing is that most people who feel fear feel less powerful. And there's a deep addiction in most of us to feeling contr under control and in power. Right? In control and in power. And, and the problem, and this applies to people on earth as well as in the spirit world, the problem is every time we contemplate feeling fear, we think that things are going to be, I'm going to have less power and less control. And the reality is it's going to feel like that, but it's not actually going to be true from God's perspective. It'll feel like that. That's a part of the processing of the fear. Which was the, the question that came up while you were speaking is why do I feel like I'm going backwards just talking about this? Correct. And so is this why? Yeah. This is why. This is why. And many of you feel exactly the same. When I say to you, you haven't even, haven't even accepted your facade yet, and most of you felt like, no, you're beyond that point, you feel like I'm telling you, you need to go back to a place that you thought you were already over, right? And that's hard when you've already believed yourself to be over it, right? So that, that is an issue. You're going to feel like that, but actually you will be progressing. J and just because we feel something, it doesn't mean it's real. It's just a feeling we have in that moment, right? And remember, all of the pain believes a whole heap of things are real, that are not real at all. And the terror believes a whole heap of things that are real that are not real at all. Right? So we've got to remember that when we come to uh, dealing with a lot of these kind of things emotionally, that we're going to go through periods where we believe that we're regressing. What's actually happening is we're undoing the established paradigm and we're not regressing, we're actually progressing by doing that. But we believe we're regressing only because of what we already believe, which has been established in this process, what the pain has established as real. Yep. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay, so, so you can see that and in that place we reject God's gifts, and many of you will be tempted to do this for some time yet. You'll be tempted to continue to reject, and, and this, uh, until you get to this, really there's always this temptation, right? Until you get to actually feel and release this terror, there's always going to be this temptation to revert back, to revert back, because the terror tells you, revert back, revert back, go back, go back, you're going the wrong direction. 
So you're going to be tempted. Most of you are going to do it. If you're not careful, most persons I know have done it. Like yes, hundreds of thousands of people have heard divine truth. There's now 4,000 who are listening at the most. So what, what's that demonstrate to you? Demonstrates to you the majority who have heard divine truth have got to the point of confronting their facade and said, no, look, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go further. My fear is going to dictate to me, if I let it, it's going to dictate to me what my next course of action is. Right? And many of you sit there and think, it's not going to happen to me, but it will happen to you. You've got to be more honest about it and feel it's there and feel its motivations and develop the faith to get through it. Mm. Okay, let's. what else can we ask about God's gifts? Um, if we go to Rachel, thank you. And, thanks. and then Fab, you had your hand up too? So Fab is after that. Um, in your notes, you've got um, the anarchy is not possible in the universe mm -hmm. due to universal laws. Can, yep. can you speak more about that? Yeah, no, it's a very important thing to understand in that, in that because God has created law that governs every single portion of God's universe, including the human soul, it's impossible to be an anarchist, really. We think we're being an anarchist, but we're actually degrading our condition through the, you know, through the way the laws operate, and eventually we, come, we have so little power to do anything, if we continue in that vein, that we're unable to go any further than, than our own degradation has pulled us to the point of. And as a result of that, it's really impossible to be an anarchist and destroy the universe. You can't. It's just physically impossible. To, to do and God's created it purposefully like that knowing that we might have a desire to do it even so feels so. like that's what all of that is anarchy <laughs> well um, it is in a way it's our uh, I suppose you could say probably more correctly is that that's our attempt at anarchy <laughs> not a very successful one you remember right back in the first group we talked about right at the beginning the very first introductory talk we talked about this whole concept that the majority of humankind still believe they have pleasure when they're actually engaging painful things and feel a lot of pain. And, and this is the problem, is that our desensitisation to pain causes us to believe we're benefiting ourselves and our decision to only have pleasure causes us to believe that we're benefiting ourselves while at the same time, because we're emotionally desensitised, we continue degrading. And if you examine the society on earth you can see quite strongly the results of that all of this all of this terrible turmoil that we experience and a lot of pain that we experience and yet we haven't learned you know we, we call ourselves intelligent beings but the reality is we keep doing the same thing over and over again hoping for a different result right we keep breaking god's laws over and over again and, and we don't even think of it like that does that make sense? We don't even think that we're breaking God's laws. But we are hoping for a different result, but always getting the same result. Mm. There's a great James Blunt song that talks about that. Give me reasons, but don't give me choice. And I've been singing it to myself <laughs> because yeah. I don't want to have that choice in a way. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Fabio, you were... Now, Hilga, I missed you, didn't I, last time? It's all done now, isn't it? Sorry about that. <clears throat> the question I've got is in regards to, you know, before you're on the divine life path, in, well, personally, before I was on the... I could probably imagine a lot of things that could have been possible in the universe. Yeah. And then getting on this path and then realising all the facades and then the terrors, it's like today, for example, I've been com like so block to a lot of what you're talking about yeah. because I realise the amount of terror. Yeah. So is that because it's just starting to find that there is so much terror that it's shutting me down? I'm just trying to understand why, why? at one stage you can be open to stuff and at another stage you shut. Yeah, this is about ignorance versus awareness. You know, what, what happens, we, we call it blissful ignorance, right? Yeah. And, and it's not actually very good for us. But, but with ignorance, uh, let's look at the scale of ignorance. Um, in a state of ignorance, um, sometimes we are quite open to new concepts. 
ironically. Right, so if we, we, if we scale ignorance versus truth, initially when we're ignorant, many times because we don't know the effect it's going to have on us, do you follow me? You don't know how it's going to personally affect you. So this is, how, this is what it was like for many of you when you first heard about some guy calling himself Jesus talking at, say, you know, one of the old venues that we had years ago. You go, oh, you're ignorant of what it's going to mean for you, right? So you go, I'll go along to that, just see what it's like. <laughs> Isn't that how you felt? Oh, I'll do the crazy thing, go along and see what the, <laughs> see what the silly man says. So that's the state of ignorance, right? You don't know what you don't know and you don't know what you're going to be told and so you're pretty open at that point to going, to, to receiving. And then you hear some truth. Now your ignorance level is dropping and your truth is increasing but now what happens to your fear? Now you're starting to know what you don't, didn't know before. Ooh, now, now fear kicks in. See, see, in the state of ignorance, fear wasn't there so much, or, or, or it would be more appropriate to say you could ignore your fears in that state. So you could just ignore it say, oh, I don't know, don't care about that, whatever. Now that truth is developing and the desire for it, and particularly truth about oneself, Fab, your ignorance now, it's like now it's becoming very personal. Before you could just think, oh, just go along, see what we learn whatever yeah so oh, that was real fascinating i'll go again and then he starts talking about this yeah it's like ah <laughs> like pretty much yeah. all right can we get back to the <laughs> other thing that i can be so i can be ignorant of self while at the same time try to develop some you know understanding of the universe and and the beauty of god's way is you know, this is a lovely thing about God's gift of God's way. You can't do that. You can't be ignorant of God's truth while at the same time be ignorant of self. Uh, sorry, accept God's truth while at the same time be ignorant of yourself mm. or your own truth. You can't do it. Now, at the beginning, most of you didn't know that. So you're okay. You were entrapped. <laughs> you were trapped. Not by me, but by the fact that the truth exposes certain things and as a result of the truth exposing certain things, now the harsh reality starts kicking in, right? And this is when we start to go, okay, I was, I, I, I was thought about those gifts before that God was offering, but I've lost any motivation, <laughs> personal motivation to engage them because of this problem. I'm becoming, I'm having to become, he's asking me to become more aware of myself. Yeah, I feel, I feel like, if I I'll be honest, I feel a little bit inspired about, you know, finding out this stuff about myself, but in a great amount of terror about it. So, terror always suppresses desire, Fab. Yeah. Always. <laughs> and I f see that and I'm like, well, that's a good thing. So, I must have a bit more truth about myself. Yeah, but see, you're saying to yourself that's a good thing, but the feeling, no, the terror that, yeah. is saying it's a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. You, you see, you've got to stop thinking that you're thinking with your head. You're not. You, you're thinking with your heart, and your heart's saying it's a bad thing. Yeah, it's true. And until you get through this, your heart's going to say it's a bad thing. Yeah. That's reality. That's why you'll be tempted, when I say this, this refusal of terror, until you you know, get through the refusal of terror, you will think that, that you know, going there is a bad thing. Yeah. Once you get through this refusal of terror, you'll know that it was a great thing that you went through it. You will. And therefore, you'll be able to look at this with a lot more of a positive feeling. Yeah. You follow? But while, while you're in this state of not passing through this yet, there is this underlying emotion <laughs> saying... Don't go there, don't go there, don't go there, don't go there. Constantly. And, and anything that draws me there further, and the, and the discussion of God's gifts, for example, draws you there further. Mm. 
Because what it does is give you some faith in God that you didn't have before and it goes, oh, maybe I'm going to have to do it type of feeling. You know? <laughs> maybe it's the only way, like he's been saying to me for years, it's the only way, but <laughs> yeah. maybe it is. Uh, I don't really know yet, but maybe it is. Maybe that's possible. And, and the problem with that is it draws you closer and closer to your terror mm. and therefore to a much higher desire to shut down emotionally. Yeah. Because you, you, once you start hitting your terror, you have a stronger desire to shut down. Right? The key is to stay open, but the majority of us don't. We start hitting the terror and we want to close down, we want to close down. And to be honest, we do anything, including not listening, not, not reflecting in God's universal truths anymore. Mm -hmm. So what I notice a lot of people do in this place, where they're touching this or they're still in the deconstruction process, is they actually refuse to remember the very things they were taught at the beginning about the universal truths. Yeah. Because every time you remember it, it re-establishes some faith and causes you to feel like you've got to go through this too. Yeah. Right? So you get in a bit of a cycle here sometimes where you're going, I'll reject some of the stuff I learnt before and hopefully that will mean that I won't feel as terrified as I am now. And then you feel bad and you feel quite shut down because you're shutting down quite heavily, so you feel bad. And then you start going, oh, I want to read some more about this lovely gifts that God's given me and this wonderful self that God's created, so you read more about it. And then it increases your faith and then you go back, and here I go again, I'm stuck at the same point again. Do you know what I mean? And you might go through that cycle quite a number of times actually before you actually have enough faith and enough humility to actually go through it as an emotion. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why we reject God's gifts. It's also why we reject our real self a lot. After we've learnt the universal truths, we, we, we get in this state of personal panic about the individual stuff that we have to go through. And, and it's always those niggly emotions, you know? Those niggly emotions, that <laughs> emotion of terror. Emotion of terror. He, he'll always try to get you back up here. Back up here. The role of error is to protect itself. I liked it earlier this morning when Mary was doing the homework with you and somebody at the back, I forget who it was, said, I, I won my first argument with my facade. Who was that? Yvonne. That's right, yeah, <laughs> joy. And so, so, yeah, won your first argument with your facade. That's a good sign. <laughs> You'll probably have many more yet to go, but, but, but you see the facade mostly wins our arguments because we're driven by the terror. And the terror dictates our beliefs and therefore all of our argumentation and all of our logic. So this is the trouble, is that we reject God's gifts. In the beginning we accepted it because of we didn't know what we were accepting. Mm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's the answer. Yeah, thanks. Prefer the, the beauty of sometimes the beginning in ignorance is that you don't know, you know, much about anything, and so you think that everything will be pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> and so you start engaging something and then only to find that it's much more difficult than you thought. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That was interesting, yes? Yeah. yeah. How many of you feel that way? Yeah, quite a lot, huh? This is, this is what we're trying to help you over is this stuck on, you know, you get stuck on self and the problem is you start rejecting the very thing that led you to self. And, and that's why it's such an important thing to develop your loving self because, because, and that's why we wanted to cover it as the second thing in our presentations. Because if you get stuck on self, and particularly with regard to some basic emotions, then no further development is possible. And also, it's highly likely regression will occur, where you choose regression purposefully in order to uh, avoid the global emotion, the refusal of terror. Yeah, in order to avoid the emotion of terror. Sad, eh? So we sort of get in this place where we're in this little cycle, rejecting all of God's lovely gifts, rejecting you know, how we're made, rejecting the other half of self, because now we're required to do something different inside of ourselves and, it's, and it feels too challenging. Whereas before, when we first heard divine truth, we, weren't, we didn't feel like we were required to do anything. We just sat there and listened. So it's a lot easier to do that. And this is why most people go through that cycle where initially they're really enthusiastic, 
about what they're hearing and they're fascinated. You know, and, and many of you felt that way. You come to the first one and said, hey, that made a lot more sense than I thought it would. And that drew you to the second one. And then you came and that made a lot more sense than I thought it would. And that answered a lot of my questions that I've had all my life. So I'll go to the third one and so forth. But then after you've gone to 10 or 20 and Jesus starts introducing, well, now you guys are ready to have a look at yourselves. Now it's more difficult. Yeah, it's the look at self, the accepting of the facade, the look, of, the look at the self that is the most difficult process that you'll ever face, as I've said to you many times in this, in this group. Mm. Right, any other questions? Thanks, Suzanne. <coughs> when you want you to stand up for me, thanks? Thank you. Just relative to God's gifts, when mm. you were talking this morning and a couple of times I've thought there are so many metaphors in nature about God's gifts, like the butterfly and morphogenic fields, and, yes. and I don't even know anything about science. But yes, yeah, and every single metaphor demonstrates something in a higher version of the universe. Mm. Yeah, see, God, God has not left us without um, indica indicative directions. He, he's basically already showing us through the study of the physical what the spiritual may be like. Does that make sense? Yeah. And in the study of the spiritual, he's showing you what the soul stuff will be like. Yeah. So, so this is a very loving thing to do if you think about it. So, it's, it's like providing all these clues in the environment that allow you to discover the truth. So, you know, for me, a lot of the clues in the first century were just like fascinating. Very first time I ate an almond in the first century. Have a fond, as Mary knows, affection for almonds, because. <laughs> They they help me feel about the soulmate issue. Because hmm. I'd be there breaking the almond in two, shelling it first, you know, taking the shell off, and then putting them in some hot water and what you call nowadays blanching them, and then and then taking the shell, uh, splitting it in, in half, and you put it back together and they fit together, and then I'd go to another one and split in half and try to join the two other halves you know, that didn't match together and couldn't join them together. It's just really interesting. Why did God create a seed in two halves? Isn't that strange? There are some seeds that are not like that, right? But there are a lot of seeds that God created in two halves. And yet it makes no real sense as to why they're in two halves. Does it? Like you, you think of the average seed, you know, like a wheat seed or something like that or even the smaller seeds the more round seeds and so forth you can't sort of split them apart to see whether there's two halves or not uh, but they don't appear to have two halves you know when you look at them and that's all i had to do was to look at them so so then i get these other seeds and they're them in half and they're two halves and, and they fit together and fit apart it's weird this like i thought it was weird yeah. i did and i was only little you know like by this day i think i was about three or four you know, just, you know. <laughs> Why did God do that? Yeah. Well, it never occurred to me until you heard the higher law and you went, oh. Sorry there. Well, it never, I, I never really wondered about it until I heard the higher law and I went, hey, yeah. that's like that other law. Yeah. And then it's really beautiful. Yeah, it is. It's like, and I find so many things like that. And in fact, there's a wonderful statement in the Robert James Lee's books that actually says that the lower laws understanding the lower laws lead you to the higher laws in mm -hmm. fact so it's a it's a beautiful thing god's done to enable us to understand mm -hmm. isn't it isn't it great that god's engaged even in the design of things a learning process in the process of understanding and and the more we discover scientifically the better it is for us actually because you, you, you examine even the way that the sperm and egg cells combine and then what they create. They create a completely different creature than the two halves individually, don't they? There's a commingling of the DNA in that process. And once the commingling of DNA occurs, there's now a whole heap of laws that engage that wouldn't have engaged unless the commingling occurs. Right? Isn't that interesting? This tells me yeah, if I was a scientist, this would tell me that maybe you put some things together and now a whole series of other laws get generated. Mm -hmm. And that is actually the truth when it comes to receiving God's love. You, you know, if you inject God's love into a situation, then a whole heap of other things get created that weren't potentials mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. 
But, you know, there's a whole heap of things. And you, you brought up ov the obvious one of the butterfly, you know, the grub mm -hmm. turning into the butterfly and so forth. And, and nowadays they've only recently discovered, haven't they, that, that the grub actually completely dissolves. And isn't that a wonderful analogy to what's going to happen to you? <laughs> <laughs> you. I didn't mean it to be that funny, but anyway. <laughs> you are going to be completely dissolved because what you think you are at this point, God is trying to destroy and all of God's laws are trying to destroy. And I mean destroy all of the things that you created through sin. What you think you are, God's trying to destroy. So it's like dissolving the grub. And, and, and in fact, you can't become the butterfly unless the grub's dissolved. Right? Which actually has, if you think about it, a lot of metaphor in, in our presentation this week, hasn't it? So even that's very interesting. And I used to sit down, in, I've, I've described to you in the past how I went to a butterfly house in one place and we used to just, and I went there with Mary again. I just said, oh, I've got to take you there too. And we both had the same feeling, you know, like just sitting there watching the whole thing, the whole process, and the feeling that overcomes you, just like, yeah, this is what's happening to me. I've got to let, I've got to let the old grub like go. That is a psychologically disturbing concept. I wonder how the grub feels about it. It's like I've got to psych myself up to let myself go. Oh, what does he feel? You know, like uh, I'm not going to do it yet. <laughs> I'll hold on a bit more. You know, I don't, I don't know what he feels, but, you know, a grub has two brains, by the way, so, you know, like it's like one in the middle of his back, I think, and one in his head. But, um, but, the, but you know, obviously he doesn't have that kind of cognizance. But, but you imagine you, you're there, you're like, you'd be freaked out, and that's how you feel. You're freaked out about losing what you believe yourself to be in order to become what God knows you can be. And many of you are not willing to engage that psychologically disturbing process. Right, and there's, there's your terror. There's your terror again. Refuse it will be your real self because it's a psychologically confronting process to become your real self through the process. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure. Sandra, thanks. So with um, creation, like, you know, the things that are actually not so... Um, look like they might be out of harmony with love, like the fact that ants are all female, for example, and um, and then this term I have male and female. Does that mean that this is our creation of our era imposed on creatures? No, God's no. created a whole variety okay. of creatures, some of which are uh, like obviously required for the proper operation of his universe. There's no single creature that is not essential for the operation of God's universe, otherwise God wouldn't have created it. So mosquitoes is essential for the operation of God's universe, but, but only the physical universe. You won't have them in the spirit state. So it's only here in the physical state that they are essential. You go, oh, great. But to be honest, if you didn't have them, like if you didn't have the common fly, we would be up to our necks and possibly higher in waste. You know what I mean? There'd be nothing to assist the decomposition process. Every single uh, thing God has created has a role, and, and we just don't mostly understand the roles, and so we condemn the, being, the, the, the creation. You know? But the key is to come to understand the roles. And, and this is why I feel important to know too, is that, is that every single creation that God has physically, spiritually, and soul-based creations, which God does have, Every single one of them has been created to support your existence. So mosquitoes have been created to support your existence. The only reason why they get out of harmony with love is because there's a whole heap of unhealed emotions that these things now must reflect to help you correct the problem. Right? So particularly with mosquitoes, lack of love of self. That's why most of us get bitten by them all the time, right? Lack of love of self. The more you love yourself, the less you'll be bitten. And once you get into a complete love of self, you won't be bitten at all. And so will mosquitoes bother you then? You could live out in the bush, you know, with a little cover over the top of you on a nice bed, because you want a comfortable bed. And, and, and 
you would you would you could have mosquitoes all around you and not a single one of them would bite you uh, if you're in harmony with love uh, and this is the thing we've got to see that a lot of what we're measuring in the universe we're measuring from a condition of sin we don't know what it would be like out of a condition of sin because we've had thousands and thousands of years of it only being in a condition of sin and therefore we measure that as normal when it's really not normal yeah. can i ask another question sure like the cook you know the cuckoo bird how it um gives take yeah it's like <coughs> parasitic relationship where they get the animal yeah. they put their own eggs that's is I, that I think we're getting way off okay, track sorry now. so <laughs> let's move on shall we yeah, not important question paul you can discover the answers of those, Sandra, in your own okay. development. Um, Yvonne said earlier that, um, or asked, are you God's gift to us, being the messenger of truth? Yep. And um, uh, uh, that's the first part of the question. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but I, haven't I already answered it with that? Well, um, I didn't think fully because are you put me under pressure, you Paul. <laughs> <laughs> what are you? What are you doing to me? No, no, well, well, I didn't feel like you accepted that to start with. Right. So you're trying to make me accept it. <laughs> I thought you were putting me under pressure. <laughs> <laughs> And the second part is, <laughs> are, are we also then God's gift to each other of course. when we accept your true self? Ourselves. Yep, you are. Isn't that a wonderful thought? You're God's gift to each other if you accept your true nature and personality. Only then, actually. Yeah, it's a wonderful thought, isn't it, really? So I am not God's gift to you in any more extreme way than you're God's gift to me, which is the reason why I answered the way that I did with Yvonne. Does that make sense? Mm, except for that you have accepted. No, no there's oh. no except. There's no except. Yeah, I know you want to make the exception that I have accepted my real nature, but the truth is that when you accept your real nature, you'll be just as a gift to me as I am to you. Does that make sense to you? So you well, well, it does, but when I accept myself, then I will be, but, but you have accepted yourself. So well, yeah, you of course, the, are, yeah. the real big word mm. is if, isn't it? If I do. So, so if I accept myself and I accept my personality, I accept my nature and I choose to develop that God's way to the point where I also have my other half choosing to develop that God's way and so forth, then, of course, I'll be a gift, a real gift to everyone around me, God's gift to everyone around me. So what applies to me applies to you. You've got to get away from this thing that many of you still have and that is that what applies to me doesn't apply to you. <clears throat> Not true. What applies to me applies to you. It's the same for us. We've had, to, uh, we've had to embrace our true nature and our true personality. We've had to embrace our will. We've had to, we've had to desire to do it with God so that we could receive God's love and have the relationship with God. Only then have the benefits, the benefits you're currently receiving through this education even, have only been engaged by somebody, by us, engaging that process, the exact process that we're suggesting you engage. Yep. And, and if we had chosen, if we had chosen differently, it would be somebody else, I would assume, who chose it. And therefore they would be that gift. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But each one of you have that. Your soul, your whole soul has that. A gift to each other, a gift, uh, God's gift to educate us and to uh, help us understand God. Yeah. And and what you're saying is that you and Mary haven't fully embraced that gift, um, so we're not fully experiencing that at the moment. Is well, it, it's if you think about it from a logical perspective, no individual probably ever is going to fully embrace the gift because we're finite beings approaching the infinite. Do you see what I'm saying? So 
you could say that really it's only God that has that final gift, if you like, in its full expressed nature, and we're working our way towards that. So what, what I've learned is that the more I, you know, obviously I have to get rid of the sin first, and then the more I develop my loving self, the more benefit I am, firstly, the more joy and happiness I receive myself, but also the more benefit I am to the rest of humanity. And you can see that, right, that that must be the truth. So, so you know, it does get down to that wonderful little word, doesn't it? It's a wonderful little two-letter word, powerful two-letter word, if, if I choose, if I decide, if I use my will, if. Like, that's a big if, and, and the if is completely your decision. Yeah, just like it had to be ours. So, so I recognised in the first century that God wanted somebody to be first. <laughs> and, I, and I didn't want to be first. I was just looking around waiting for somebody to be first like you are now. <laughs> Until I worked out that actually nobody seemed to want to be first. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, I might as well be first if nobody else is going to be. Right? And it was a choice, a decision made to allow that. Now I also know that I had certain things happen to me that allowed for that to happen, but I only discovered that afterwards. Up until that time I thought I was just the same as everyone else too. Does that make sense? And and I realised that no, there were certain things that happened to me in the process of helping me be first. So I, So even my being first is not my own, it's not fully my of my own doing. So, th so when you talk about me, you know, as if it's being special, being first, I don't see that because I feel, no, God did that. I had to do some things, but God did some things first. Do you see? So, so I can't really, this is why I find it hard. See, it, you think it's an issue of worth that I don't accept your feelings about that, and it's certainly not an issue of worth for me. It's an issue of truth. The reality is, no, God did a whole heap of things for me. And that was a part of God's gift, certainly. Does that make sense? But God was going to do it with somebody, but that somebody would have to be a person that God knew was going to engage the will to do it God's way. Have the, to have the feeling, here I am, send me. Right, which is actually a quote from the Bible. But that's how I felt. Here I am, send me. Like, I'll do it. Nobody else seems to want to. And then after that, I realised that actually God had already knew that I would. But that, that took me after that, you know, to decide to work that out. But I didn't see it as anything special in myself. You follow me? And, it's, and I still don't feel it as such. It's not special in myself. It's something special God gave, which is very, very different to what I've developed. Now, I have developed in this life a very strong faith of my own doing. Right? But I can't say that my first century life's faith was of my own doing. Now, I have developed in this life a very strong humility. But in the first century, I can't say that my humility was fully of my own doing. Because there were certain things God did to assist me to have it. Do you follow? So, yeah, so I, I see myself the same as you see yourself. Now, at the moment, that's a problem because I need to fix my unworthy feelings about myself just like you do. Right? And I feel quite confident that I'm on the right track to doing that. But, but the reality is all of us have those unworthy feelings. <coughs> we're all going to have to work through them. And, and that is not dependent on what God's gifted us. God's gifted us equally a lot of things. And I, and I personally feel the extent of God's gifts perhaps more than you do at this stage because I feel that a lot of my life in the last 2,000 years has been the fact that I've received a gift, some gifts that you are now receiving from, through the mechanism God's provided, but, but I receive them from God so I feel it's a unique 
sort of thing, but God had to do it with somebody because the way things were going was that sin was going to dominate everything, but it had to wait to a person to, you could say, it had to wait until humanity, the condition of humanity, had developed enough to allow for a person to have that feeling. Does that make sense? Here I am, send me. And the thing which I take from it sort of is that you chose to embrace being yourself and and be yourself in the world to the degree where yep. you're, you're, you're expressing yourself. And this is... But I've learnt far more about it now than I knew about it before through this, in, through yep. this return process. Yep. But this is a huge motivation for what the gift we can give to the world by just <laughs> embracing ourselves. our personality, our exactly. being ourselves. Exactly. If you think of every one of God's gifts, and the reason why, and perhaps we need to finish on this topic, every single one of God's gifts to develop your loving self has to be engaged before it will be realised, right? And tomorrow morning, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about your role in engaging these gifts. But all of these gifts have been provided equally to all persons. right? So God, God's not a differentiator of people he's not partial he's impartial so so god's giving these gifts to all persons and it really gets down to the greek if if we decide we can engage the gift or not and and this is what we need to understand what, what we hope to have helped you with today is to see that wow there's just an amazing soul <laughs> that you are the pinnacle of god's creation and, and, and at this stage, I understand that you might not understand how great it is, but if I say just those words that it's more complex than any other being, creation in the universe and it's actually more complex than the universe itself, that will give you some idea of why God feels you are the pinnacle of God's creation as a soul, complete soul. And being the pinnacle of God's creation, God then offers you all these things that God's not offered other creations. He offers you these same things that God hasn't given to other creations. Other creations have limitations which you don't have. right? And God's done all of these things and offered all of these gifts. And the real question is, what am I going to do with that? Isn't it? I, I, am I going to choose to engage? Or am I going to choose to stay you know, in this fear and not engage? Or am I going to choose to use my will even after I've dealt with all the sin to not engage? What am I going to do? There's no guarantee that after you've gotten rid of all that that you'll even engage after that. No guarantee because that's an exercise of your will. That's the big if. And that's why we want to talk about that with you tomorrow morning. Is that all right? Thank you. Okay, so I feel that's a natural place to finish. So let's finish there. Thanks, guys. And we'll see you tomorrow at uh, bright and early at 11 o'clock, <laughs> as if that's bright and early, and, uh, and present the last four hours of our entire week. Last day. Hooray! <laughs> <No. laughs>